So this got handed to me this morning. Uh, it was signed by an anonymous coworker. It's one of these little cards, what you want to hear talked about. If I buy you a cup with a straw, would you use it? The bottle and lid annoys me. Okay, first of all, Tyler Harnish, where are you? If you hand me physically the card, you're not an anonymous coworker. And secondly, no, okay, this is, I'm not gonna do that, so you can deal with it. Um, the opportunity to submit questions, uh, thanks to Tyler, is now closed. There will be no more questions accepted. Uh, the one we're doing this morning has actually been asked every year I've done this. So I, I counted them up, I've done these four times, this series four times, and this is the fourth time this has been submitted. And so I feel like somebody out there has been really ticked off that year after year they submit the same question and I don't answer it. So you were, whoever you are, the persistent widow. Remember we talked about her? And you're now getting your way. Now if you remember, as Jesus instructed, the person that eventually gave in didn't care about her at all. That's the role I'm playing. I don't care, but I'm just doing this to get you off my back. All right? So here was the question that was asked. Sometimes... My non-Christian friends will say I don't really follow the Bible because I don't follow all of the food laws that are in the Old Testament. I tell them that that was for that time only, but then they say that I'm just picking the parts of the Bible that I want to obey. They also say that all the food laws show how outdated and silly the Bible is. Is there a good response? So this, again, has been asked for four years in a row. Let me start off by saying this. Before we go any further in this, I need you all to know that I think this is one of the funniest and silliest objections that people have. And you'll hear that. You'll hear them try to mock Christians or mock Bible believers. Have you seen what's in there? We've all heard this to some degree before. The Bible is silly. Look at all these ridiculous laws. You can't wear fabric that has, uh, you, you can't wear a piece of clothing that has the same kind, two different kinds of fabric. You, you can't eat shellfish on a Sunday afternoon with your uncle I mean that's not one but it's like that those are silly rules why would you ever follow something so ridiculous as that you hear this all the time and I find it hilarious and here's why um, there was this video that was done and I'm only going to show you the portion that get up, gets up to Indiana all this video did was take one law from every state in the union currently on the books okay this is currently I'm not talking about in the 1850s 2023, these are laws that are current laws in the states of the United States, and we're only going to go through alphabetical order up to Indiana. We'll stop there. Can we roll this, please? In Alabama, it's illegal to wear a fake mustache in church that makes people laugh. In Alaska, you can't wake up a sleeping bear to take a photo. In Arizona, it's illegal to let a donkey sleep in a bathtub. In Arkansas, you can't honk your car horn near a sandwich shop after 9 p.m. In California, if a frog dies during a frog jumping contest, it is illegal to eat that. In Colorado, you are not allowed to keep a couch on your porch. In Connecticut, a pickle cannot legally be called a pickle unless it bounces. In Delaware, it is illegal to sell dog hair. In Florida, if you tie an elephant to a parking meter, you have to pay the same parking meter dues that you would with a car. In Georgia, you can't keep an ice cream cone in your back pocket on Sundays. In Hawaii, it is illegal to stick a coin in your ear. In Idaho, it is illegal to give someone a box of chocolates weighing more than 50 pounds. In Illinois, it's illegal to fall asleep in a cheese shop. In Indiana, it's illegal to catch a fish with your bare hands or a firearm. They enacted the one in Indiana because of Phil Evenson. I don't know if you've ever been fishing with Phil. I went one time, we got in the boat, he said, you ready? <laughs> Freakiest thing I've ever seen. Okay, <laughs> but he caught some serious fish. All right, so this is what I'm saying. Don't talk to me about silly, stupid laws. We've got them. We've got them all over the place. Is it silly to us that they had a law that they couldn't wear fabric that had two different types of... Of course it is. Just like it's kind of silly to anybody that you have to bounce a pickle off the street if you're going to actually call it a pickle. All right? Now, so we're going to drop this act that we are somehow in 2023 so much more enlightened than all of these people that lived before us. But let's get back to the actual question. Is there a good response when somebody says, well, you're just picking and choosing the parts of the Bible that you want to follow. All right, so here's the answer to that. Number one, yes, there is a really good response, and we're going to talk about that response right now. 
However, I need to stress number two. If someone is posing this argument to you, there is a very good chance they are not interested in a serious answer. They're, they're not really interested in whether or not you are abiding by what scripture teaches. Chances are your non-Christian friends that are saying this are not going to accept your really good response, even if you have one. So what I'm doing here is providing to you the reason why what they're saying doesn't stick. I'm not, su I'm not suggesting that somehow this is going to compel them to believe. We know the reality. We know about blind eyes, and we know about hard hearts, and we know about darkness wanting to run away from the light. Okay, it's not your burden if they choose to reject the truth. I need you to remember that. You're not, you're not judged based on whether or not your scoffer friends end up becoming believers. What are we to do as Christians? Our job is to be a faithful witness to the truth, to live for Jesus, to live like Jesus, and then let him handle the consequences. Okay? So that's an important thing to remember. Now, that we've prefaced it that way, let's flip to the book of Leviticus. We'll be in Leviticus 11 all morning because you're never in Leviticus in a church service. Leviticus chapter 11, and we're going to start with verses 1 through 8. Okay? This is over clean and unclean food. We're in verse 1. We ready? The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, who is he speaking to? Moses and Aaron. Who did Moses and Aaron lead? Israel. The old Israelites, which we talked about last week, were a nation set apart for a particular purpose. Verse 2. Say to the Israelites of all the animals that live on the land, these are the ones you may eat. You may eat any animal that has a split hoof completely divided and that chews the cud. we got to stop. I don't know what the cud is. I don't want to know what the cud is. It sounds disgusting. But let's move on. Verse 4. There are some that only chew the cud and only have a split hoof, but you must not eat them. The camel, though it chews the cud, does not have a split hoof. It is ceremonially unclean for you. The coney, I didn't even know the coney was an animal. I don't, what is the coney? Oh, it's a rock badger. My little, I don't even know what a rock badger is. Okay, it's fine. <laughs> The coney, though it chews the cud, does not have a split hoof. It is unclean for you. The rabbit, though it chews the cud, does not have a split hoof. It is unclean for you. And the pig, though it has a split hoof completely divided, does not chew the cud. It is unclean for you. You must not eat their meat or touch their carcasses. They are unclean for you. All right. You want to talk about detail. That's detail right there. I mean, we're getting into the nitty-gritty of what certain animals do seems overly precise. I would even say it's a little obsessive when you look at that. And we're not going to stop there. Before we stop for, for just a minute, I want you to see how badly the owl gets rocked. Go down to verse 9. I always thought everybody liked owls. Owls seem, they're not like birds that are weird with their eyes going in all different directions. We were moving yesterday. Uh, sorry, this is off topic, but it's fine. Um, we were moving yesterday, and Grayson was riding with me in the U-Haul truck, and we saw like a little flock of, I don't know, the sparrows, are they still around? Have they flown away? But anyway, there's little birds running around, and Grayson's like, oh, the birds are cute. I'd like to have a bird. Would you like to have a bird? I said, no, they're disease-ridden. They're filth. I don't want a bird around. He was appalled by that. He was more appalled when this stupid bird, they're not smart, was sitting on the tire of the U-Haul truck, didn't move. When I started to move forward, Grayson saw a massacre right there in front of his eyes. I'm so sorry to tell you that. Okay, now let's get back to what I was saying. Oh, the owl. So the owl is not like a bird. Like the owl, everybody loves the owl. You remember owl from Winnie the Pooh? Apparently the Lord does not care for the owl. Let's pick it up in verse 9. Okay, we invert, no, 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 verse 13. These are the birds that you are to detest and not eat because they are detestable. The eagle. Sorry, America, the vulture, the black vulture, the red kite, any kind of black kite, we're not going to have any of those around, any kind of raven, and here we go, the horned owl, the screech owl, the gull, any kind of hawk, the little owl, the cormorant, the cormorant, the great owl, the white owl, the desert owl, the osprey, the stork, any kind of heron, the hoopoe, and the bat. All right, you got it? That's pronounced hoopoe, just like that, right. <laughs> So let's make a couple observations about this passage. Not an ordinary passage on a Sunday morning. Number one, this is not the most engaging literature. No one would expect you to sit down with your children at night as you're reading the scriptures and get all excited, oh, we're almost to the osprey. Nobody's going to expect that to happen. It's not the most engaging literature. And number two, it leaves a rational person in 2023 asking a couple fairly obvious questions. Obvious question number one, why? 
Why all of this stuff? Why spend all of these pages of scripture to tell the Israelites what they could and could not eat? And secondly, what is it exactly that makes an animal pure and an animal impure? I mean, people try to do this. They try to separate them and say, okay, here are all the pure animals and here were all the impure animals. What made these impure? Let's see what they all have in common and let's see what these all have in common and try to figure it out. And there are some common answers about number two, what made animals pure and unpure. Some people say it's health reasons. That's why God does this. In other words, the argument is that pure animals were good for their health and bad animals or impure animals were bad for their health. And so God is trying to take care of them by providing them good animals to eat and then stay away from these bad animals that are going to cause problems. I read one of these books that, that argues this and it does make some compelling arguments. It points out how pigs will swallow this, uh, they'll wallow around in the muck and it'll get into their system and it's got this larva that calls trich causes trichinosis. If you think that's keeping me away from bacon, it's not going to. But that is one of the things that it says that pigs do. It also points out that shrimp and lobsters, those are scavengers and they're along the seabed and they're eating things that could be contaminated. And so that's the argument. And there's multiple examples of how you could say, well, these animals, you can take the list of pure animals and find reasons that it's good for your health. And you can take the impure animals and find reasons that it's bad for your health. But there's still some giant problems with that as the argument. My question is, why would God get rid of that law if that's what it was for? I mean, have you stopped to consider that? Why would he now tell us, as Jesus does, that all animals are clean? Why would he tell us that if it was for health? Does Jesus, does God not care about our health as much now? And some people in this book that I read answered back, yes, but we have modern technology and medicine, and the Lord knew that we would have that, and that takes care of those problems. We don't have to worry about it. Right. But when did Jesus make all animals clean? He made all animals clean in A.D. 30. They didn't have modern medicine then. So to me, this argument falls kind of flat that you're going to say that was the reason that God made some things pure and impure. Other people say it's pagan related. That if you go back into these cultures, a lot of these impure animals were used in pagan rituals and pagan sacrifices. And of course, that's true. You can find pagan cultures that even um, they would dress up like those animals or have gods that look like those animals. And so maybe God is doing that. He's trying to keep Israel away from those, uh, those animals because that might lead them into pagan worship, all of those sorts of things. The glaring problem I have with that explanation is the bull. The bull is a clean animal. And if you go back into history, even to modern day, if you had to pick one animal that has been utilized in pagan worship, I think the bull and the cow would be one of them. Even today, Hindu cultures still revere and worship the cow. They, many of them believe in reincarnation. And several of you know this. If you are a really good human, you come back as something better than you in the next life. If you're a bad human, you come back as like a lampshade in the next life. But if you're a really good human in, in Hindu cultures, what is the highest form? It's a cow. Like that's the big payoff. You're a good human now. You get to come back as a heifer. I am looking for something a little bit better than that for my obedience to the scriptures, but that's what some do. So I want to stress this. I really want to stress this to you. Uh, I'm going to state the obvious of what should become very clear to us when it comes to pure and impure. The Bible doesn't tell us why. It doesn't tell us what God was thinking when he set these uh, aside and said these are pure and these are impure. And we can sit there and try to figure out what's going on, but it's simply true that the Bible doesn't tell us. Just like the Bible doesn't tell us why God planted a tree in the garden and told them that they weren't allowed to eat from it. Just like the Bible, we talked about it in Sunday school, well, Andrew talked about it, we all listened, how uh, the Bible doesn't necessarily say why God says you have to be dunked in water. He just says to do it. Okay, this is the reality that we have in front of us, but the Bible does make clear, and this is the key, the Bible does make clear what God was accomplishing with those laws, and that's what's significant. That is where our focus should be, because that is, to me, what's going to have meaning for us. Not which animals were pure, impure, and, and why they were impure, and which ones were pure, and why they were pure. No, no, what is God accomplishing with those laws? That's what's going to have meaning. A couple years ago, my oldest daughter, Addie, started this thing where she blows up. It's, it's the wildest thing to, to observe happening. It's really cool when it happens, especially when you've taken your family to a cabin right after Christmas, and it's already fallen apart because you went for the cheaper cabin, and the toilets don't work, and your wife is not happy, and we're all there, and we're all miserable, and then Addie 
starts this little blow-up routine where we don't know when it's going to happen, but all of a sudden she gets these hives and she gets really itchy and her tongue feels like it's swelling up and her lips get really puffy. She looks wild anyway. Her stomach gets upset. So this all starts happening in the cabin. We're far away from civilization. There's no cell service. There's also no toilets. So what do we do? We load up in the car and we drive 45 minutes to a hospital and then after she'd gotten this, the, what is it, uh, Benadryl? Is that what uh, they pump it through? or whatever it is. Anyway, once she got that stuff and she, you know, returned to humanity, then we had to get a hotel room that wasn't far from the hospital because in case she had another problem, but we had the stupid dog with us, so you had to find a hotel that had... It was a terrible vacation. But anyway, the doctors still to this day have not figured out why she does this. They don't know why it is. Um, for a while, we thought maybe it was environmental, but then it happens at different times of year, and sometimes she'll be inside all day long, and... But feels it coming, so we have determined, we being Jenny and I, it has to be diet. There has to be something that she eats that does this to her. So I went to WebMD. Um, <laughs> I don't have a medical degree, but I've been to WebMD. So I go there and I Google all of this, and I've got it leveled down to two things. All right, one, you're all going to recognize it's, this is a symptom of, of like celiac disease or gluten. If you have gluten in, 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 in large quantities, it can cause you to have these reactions. And that's what Jenny thought, well, maybe that's what this is. I also found, now go with me on this, that there is one other possibility, and it's a little known disease. It's actually called maple syrup urine disease. Now, every single one of the symptoms of maple syrup urine disease is what Addie does. My vote is the old MSUD. That's what I think this is. But Jenny says, I think maybe we ought to try to cut out gluten and see if that helps. And so that's what we've been doing. It actually has helped her. We haven't seen one of these little experiences in quite some time. But can I tell you how annoying the gluten thing is? Everywhere we go, and some of you have to do this, and some of you have family members that have to do this, it is super annoying. At restaurants, the waiter has to make this big federal production. Oh, you have a gluten allergy. Okay, we got to get the chef out here, and we're going to write down, well, here's what we cook with, just on and on and on. We went on vacation, and she gets, like, everybody else gets the salad and the bread at the table. She gets her own plate with a little, a little piece of wood stuck in it that says allergy on it. Like that, she has her own Play. I'll show you what I'm talking about. This was her pasta, the allergy flag. She got her own little dessert. As the four of us are having to share the other big dessert, she gets her own little plate with her own little stick. And she, listen, that's annoying to me, but she loves that. You know why? Because she's special. She's distinct. Bingo! That's what I'm talking about right there. She's special and she's distinct because of her diet. That's where I'm going with all of this. It may seem silly, but a certain diet sets people apart. And you know that. If I said, what group of people are meat eaters? You would tell me carnivores. <laughs> There's like one person that knows what a carnivore is. Right. If you see somebody tearing into a rack of ribs, you got yourself a carnivore right there. That's what that is. If I said to you somebody, uh, the group of people that don't eat meat, you tell me they are Vegetarians, right. And if I said uh, this other group of people, what did you say? Herbivore? Herbivore? <laughs> Maybe we shouldn't do the crowd participation thing. <laughs> if this is a person that doesn't eat anything from animals, which means no fish, no eggs, those people are Vegan. vegans. Did you say miserable? <laughs> I totally agree. <laughs> They are, they are vegans, right. So this, you see how this works. A certain diet will set apart a certain group of people. Now go with me on this. You go back into this era, and when you had people that wouldn't eat bacon, what did they all realize they were? Oh, that's a follower of Yahweh. It set them apart. That's the key. That's the reason behind the goal of these diet laws. Their diet set them apart as his people that everybody else would recognize. God does this all the time. He gives physical signs that help his people understand things or remember things. The rainbow, we remember God's promise to never destroy the earth for its depravity. We, we uh, celebrate communion. We just did. Why? To remember Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. That's why this church does it weekly. The early church did it. Circumcision was a physical sign that reminded the people of God's covenant with Abraham to bless all humanity through him and his lineage. All of those were, were meant to remind God's people of his nature and his covenants with man. And I'm going to suggest to you that his demands of a pure diet reminded those Israelites daily that God's very essence was purity. 
And he took purity very seriously. This is what they would have thought following all of these laws. If God has these kind of expectations on my food, I worship a God that is very serious about purity. Addie, hold on a second. Tyler, you look in here. I want you to get a good look at this. <laughs> Addie is obsessive about the gluten in her diet. Like everything, she looks at the ingredients on the whole thing. Does this have gluten in it? She's always looking to see if it's there. People who are on a keto diet, they do the same thing. You know anybody on a keto diet? Very high fats, no carbs. They're always looking at the ingredients. Does this have any carbs in it? I can't have too many carbs. Uh, my father-in-law who had heart surgery, low sodium diet. He's constantly calling Jenny to sneak him some sodium because Ann is like a... Anyway, it, you have to follow that strict diet. Bingo. God's nation is obsessive about purity, which is exactly what he desired. He put the Israelites on an impurity-free diet. And the lesson for us, to me, when I read the passage in Leviticus is, this is a God who's serious about purity. He expects the same of me. Let me show you what I mean by this. You're still in Leviticus. I want you to go to the last section I'll read to you this morning. It starts in verse 29. There's a reason I'm going to read this. Verse 29, of the animals that move about on the ground, these are unclean for you. The weasel, the rat, any kind of great lizard, the gecko, the monitor lizard, the wall lizard, the skink, and the chameleon. Of all those that move along the ground, these are unclean unclean for you. Whoever touches them when they are dead will be unclean till evening. When one of them dies and falls on something, that article, whatever its use, will be unclean. Whether it is made of wood, cloth, hide, or sackcloth, put it in water. It will be unclean till evening, and then it will be clean. If one of them falls into a clay pot, everything in it will be unclean, and you must break the pot. Any food that could be eaten but has water on it from such a pot is unclean, and any liquid that could be drunk from it is unclean. Anything that one of their carcasses falls on becomes unclean. An oven or cooking pot must be broken. They are unclean, and you are to regard them as unclean. A spring, however, or a cistern for collecting water remains clean. But anyone who touches one of these carcasses is unclean. If a carcass falls on any seeds that are to be planted, they remain clean. But if water has been put on the seed and a carcass falls on it, it is unclean for you. Okay, so here's my question. I read that passage because that is a lot right there. If I asked you and told you, you need to keep all of those rules, what are you going to, well, I know what you're going to do. You're going to tell me to shove it. But if I were to say, you need to follow this, this is God's instruction for us. If this was actually a requirement for us to do, and you decided, I'm, a, I'm following God, so I'm going to do it like these Israelites, what is the first thing you would do? If you had to keep all of those things, I, I don't know what you would do, but here's what I would do. I would go home and I would write it all out, I would map it out, I would learn it, I would study it, I would quiz myself over it, I would want to know precisely what I'm supposed to do in all of these situations and I would be on guard to make sure that I'm doing it. That's what, if this was an exp expectation on me, I would be obsessive about what it was I was supposed to do and I would think about it all day. I would have to, because it involves things that happen all day. I can't touch that. I can't eat that. That's what I would be constantly thinking about. There's a Bible professor named Jay Sklar, and he actually did this. He did this with his group of students. Uh, I want to read you this uh, short little thing that he did. I taught a semester-long seminary class on Leviticus, and one of the assignments that I gave my students was to follow as many of the laws in Leviticus as possible for a week and to keep a journal of the experience. Early on, the students shared underst understandable frustration. Several noted that the prohibition of wearing clothing of two different fabrics eliminated most of their wardrobes. One student simply commented on day two, quote, I really miss bacon. By far, however, the most common observation went along with what this young lady wrote. And he, he listed, he quoted what she had written. Every day, I find myself making decisions about ritual purity and impurity. By midweek, I realized that I was thinking about these things all day long and in every aspect of my life, and that's when it hit me. That's when I realized why these words from Leviticus have been preserved for us and they're revered as holy scriptures. God cares a lot about our purity and holiness, and it's not just from a ritual perspective, as it used to be, but also from a moral perspective. All day long and in every aspect of life, 
The Lord wants me to pursue purity in my heart, in my thoughts, in my actions. He wants me to reflect his holiness in all that I do. So I'm thinking about it constantly. I, this is what she gleaned from this exercise, I have been treating God's holiness way too lightly. Lord, help me to be holy. I think that's the lesson that's there for us. Now, luckily for those kids in that class and for us today, those dietary laws were never intended for anyone other than who God specifically gave them to. Say to the Israelites, this is what you are to do. Last week, we saw God is shielding, he is separating, he is making distinct a nation of Israel, and he is growing them for a purpose. And do we remember what that purpose was? The purpose was to bring the Messiah into the world. So the laws were, were to make them distinct, them separate, that nation and that nation alone. And once that purpose of bringing Jesus into the world was fulfilled, then Jesus declares, that's it. All foods are clean. He does it in this passage. He says in Mark 7, don't you see that nothing that enters a person from the outside can defile them? All, all of these foods that are pure and impure, nothing that you eat is going to defile you. For it doesn't go into their heart, it goes into their stomach and then out of the body. That's pleasant, Jesus, thank you. In saying this, and by the way, I put this in parentheses because it's in parentheses in Scripture. It's not that I'm adding this. This is in Scripture. In saying this, Jesus declared all foods to be clean. All of them were clean. And Peter, one of his disciples, who was a Jew, and he kept these laws and these rules, he really struggled with this. Because this was his life. This is what he always knew. And now Jesus is saying, no, 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 you don't have to do that anymore. Peter struggled to let that requirement go. And so God gives him this vision of this sheet that comes down with all of these impure animals that are on it. These ones that have been written about in Leviticus that you're not to touch. They're detestable. All of that. And a voice tells Peter, get up, Peter. Kill and eat. Surely not. Lord, Peter replied, I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times and immediately the sheet was taken back to heaven. So obviously here, Jesus has declared all of these foods to be clean. Living under the new covenant, the old one has been fulfilled. It's done. It is finished. That's what Jesus said. Jesus brought new meaning to these pages of Leviticus. We've talked about this before. The shadow reality relationship between the Old Testament and the New Testament. I say this phrase a lot. That the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. And the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. You see things in the New Testament. You say, oh, that's what was a shadow. That was, a, that was foreshadowing of what was to come in the New Testament. And when I read these and I read the testimony of this girl. I start to realize that's exactly what's playing out here. God had told his people to think about purity and to commit to it all the time, even when they sat down to eat, especially when they did. God called them to purity all the time. And Jesus is telling us the exact same thing. In the same way that they were to be obsessive about purity in their diet, you and I are to be obsessive about purity in our hearts and the way that we live around others. That's what we're called to do. That's the model of scripture. In that same passage of Mark 7 that I just read, look at what Jesus goes on to say. It is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. Impurity. Sexual immorality and theft and murder, adultery, greed, malice, lewdness, deceit, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and defile a person. You can almost hear him echoing the words, it is detestable. Stay away from such things. God was serious about it in the Old Testament. He's serious about it under the New Covenant. The question is, are we? Are we obsessing about it the way the Israelites had to obsess about their purity laws? I wonder. So I would simply say to the question asker this. This would be the response that I would give to whoever it is that says whatever it is that they say to you. Israel was given a distinct diet because they were set apart for a distinct reason. God was separating them for a purpose. And that purpose, that reason was to bring Jesus, our Messiah, into the world. And once he was here, Jesus tells us that it's not the food that makes us impure. The food rules aren't significant. That's not to be our obsession. But it's purity from within that is to be our obsession. And so I would say to you, my non-Christian friend, I want to be serious about that. Do you see that purity in me? Do you see that in me? Because that's what I want. It's what I desire. 
Put your heart in front of them. I don't know what they're going to do with it, but if they're mocking you for your faith, if they're mocking you for what you believe in Scripture, help them to understand what it is that you follow. You followed the Messiah that came from that distinct nation of Israel that was set apart by these laws by a God that demands and expects purity. And he expects the same of us. And that's exactly who you want to be. Father God, I thank you for your truth. I thank you for your word. I thank you for the lessons that we can glean from it. I thank you, uh, Father, that you provide these words from the old covenant. That we can understand more about your character. More about who you are. Father, we want to be more like you. And so these pages are useful. Help us to take the lesson of your word. Help us to apply it to our lives and to go out and put you on display. That's our desire. We pray all this in the name of Jesus, your son, our savior, our savior. And everyone said, amen. You want to come to know Christ. You want to be obedient to him in the waters of Christian baptism. Now is your opportunity. Would you come as we stand and as we sing? You're good. <laughs>